Good morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable always in your sight, O Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Black History Month. Happy Black Futures Month. Happy African Heritage Month. Happy African Liberation Month. All of those things. The theme of Black History Month across Canada this year is ours to tell. It's an opportunity to share the stories of black individuals and communities and groups here in Canada, to talk about our histories, contributions, successes, sacrifices, and triumphs. Stories of courage, stories of resilience, stories of determination, stories of overcoming, especially in this year, the bicentenary of the birth of my great-great-great-grand-aunt, Mary Ann Shad Carey, which is being celebrated with events and activities across North America this year. I am so pleased to be standing in this place on this Sunday, the last Sunday in Black History Month. It was in September 1851 that my Auntie Mary Ann, as I like to call her, born a free African-American woman in Delaware in 1823, made the journey to Toronto to attend the North American Convention of Colored Freedmen, just not very far from here at St. Lawrence Hall. And there she was convinced by fellow abolitionists to move to Windsor and establish a school for people of African descent. She did indeed move to Windsor, where, based on her principles, she established an integrated school, providing education for children during the day and for adults at night, offering settlement services for newly arrived freedom seekers in the abandoned military barracks on what is now Windsor's City Hall Square, just adjacent to my home parish of All Saints Windsor. In 1853, in Windsor, Auntie Mary Ann established the Provincial Freeman, the first newspaper in all of North America edited and published by a black woman, and the first newspaper in Canada edited and published by a woman. Later, she would move the newspaper's offices to 143 King Street East, not very far from here. So many stories are ours to tell, not just in February, but throughout the year, every year, all the time. We, people of African, Black, and Caribbean heritage here in Canada, have so many stories to tell. Stories such as the narratives of my several Underground Railroad ancestors, the Christian family, the Dunn family, the Robbins family, the Larder family, the Stone family, and others, like my husband's families, the Davises, and the Walses, and the Richardsons, and so on. Freedom seekers who made arduous and dangerous journeys of hundreds of miles to Canada from places like Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland to find a place where they could be legally free, become property owners, business owners, tradespeople, professionals, and profit from their skills for the very first time. Stories of my ancestors who were free, African Americans, my Shad and Shreve ancestors who made their way to Canada in the middle of the 19th century to build new lives and establish new pathways to liberation and success for fellow people of African descent. We all have stories to tell. I think of my great-great-grand-uncle James L. Dunn, who sued the Windsor Board of Education for its segregationist practices in 1883, losing the case but getting the best revenge by being elected a school board trustee and a town councillor so that he could change the system from the inside. Or my great-great-grandfather Robert L. Dunn, who served nine terms on Windsor City Council and was the first person of African descent to run for mayor of Windsor in 1896. We all have stories to tell. These are just a few of the shoulders on which I stand. On whose shoulders are you standing? What stories are yours to tell? And what stories should we all be sharing with one another? as a means of enhancing our mutual cultural competency, understanding, and empathy. 
February also presents special opportunities to counter the unhelpful stories that have been told about people of black, African, and Caribbean heritage without our consent. False and detrimental narratives that were expedient in the time of the transatlantic slave trade when other individuals, organizations, and institutions found it useful to deny our intelligence, our creativity, our capacity for independence and self-reliance, our very personhood. Those narratives, unfortunately, continue to have an impact on the lives of people of African, Black, and Caribbean heritage across our country today. The insidious stories told about us continue to limit our full participation in society. They can be seen in the unjust structures and unconscious bias that create racial inequities in the education system, the law enforcement and criminal justice system, the healthcare system, the child protective services system, higher than average unemployment among people of black, African, and Caribbean descent despite equal educational attainment, and the discrimination, injustice, and racial violence experienced by people of African descent in this country on an ongoing basis. Inside the church, our church, we have more work to do as well. We of the present generation may not have created all of the conditions, but we still share responsibility for cleaning them up. The underrepresentation of people of African heritage in the leadership of our church. Theological education that inadequately prepares clergy for the realities of our diverse church and that largely ignores the contributions of people of African descent from biblical times to the early church history to the present. Practices that confuse conformity with unity, pressuring Anglicans of Black, African, and Caribbean heritage to blend in and assimilate in order to get along. And the unfinished business of confronting the ways in which our church, not just the Church of England or the American Episcopal Church, but our church benefited from the proceeds of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. We are known by our fruits, we're known by our deeds, they're what tells our story. The question is, how do we live out our commitment to the baptismal covenant every day of the week, not just Sunday, but Monday to Saturday too? This is not to say that we've all perfected living out our baptismal covenant on Sunday. Sunday after Sunday, 12 months per year, have we succeeded in making everyone who joins us for worship feel welcome, accepted, and embraced? Who among us has a perfect record in practicing hospitality towards every church visitor or even towards all of us who are part of the community but may not look the same? Do we not sometimes look askance at the people who don't seem to fit into our in-group, whatever our in-group happens to be? We've all been guilty of this, myself included, although the biases we carry within us may differ from person to person. For me, it might be the way someone is attired on Sunday morning, or the rambunctiousness of someone's child during the worship service. For some others, it might be about age, or gender, or disability, or ethnicity, or race. Every year, occasions like Black History Month afford us the opportunity not only to reflect on the stories of the people and events that have shaped the landscape of our communities and our nation, positive stories and more challenging stories, but to reflect on and confront the state of anti-Black racism in the present day. To work through the difficult questions, to consider the blind spots we tend to ignore throughout the rest of the year. One of my favorite prophets, James Baldwin, once wrote that not everything we face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Our journey through Black History Month is nearly at an end. But our journey through Lent is just beginning. Lent offers us opportunities to reflect on the things that separate us from God and from another, to seek reconciliation with God and with our brothers, sisters, and siblings. As I mentioned, the theme of Black History Month has been ours to tell. As we exit Black History Month and embark on our collective Lenten journey, I would invite you to prayerfully consider the stories we are telling. By our deeds, we are known. Our actions and behaviors as followers of Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
show the entire world who we are and what we believe. Our daily actions have to tell the story of a people who are committed to seeking and serving Christ in all persons and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Our daily actions need to tell the story of a people who are dedicated to striving for justice and peace among people and respecting the dignity of every human being. Our daily actions must tell the story of a people who have agreed to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, not just with fists or guns, but the kind of harm that happens to the body, mind, and spirit, and to pursue peace and reconciliation. My sisters, brothers, and siblings, these are the stories that are ours to tell. These are not topics we should avoid. These are conversations that we as Christ followers should be leading. Who better is positioned, better positioned than the church, you and me, all of us together, to lead the way towards racial justice and reconciliation, to model for others what it looks like to proclaim justice and mercy as we seek to walk with our God, not just at this time of year, but at every time of year, not just on Sunday, but all through the week, not just in church, but wherever we move through the world, our workplaces, our schools, the voting booth, our neighborhoods, our streets. As the song says, who will speak if we don't? I choose to remain hopeful, confident even, that we will with God's help. Thanks be to God.